okay, we could start sort of. Uh, those of you who are standing in the back, you're welcome to come down and sit on the steps in the front or the floor in the front or the table over there uh, if you want to. Uh, we've got, we're going to have many too many people in the room here today because there's uh, 50 people on the waiting list who I are, I'm hoping we will, we, they'll be able to get into the course, and I've told anyone who asked they should come to the first meeting. So uh, how many are on the waiting list here? Okay, well, I think there's probably good news. I mean, we've now got a fourth teaching assistant. That was the first thing we needed. Now we need a new room, or maybe, and this is a far-fetched story which I have to tell you, the course is going to be podcast. That means that, uh, in principle, you could go to all the lectures without ever coming here. That's important because you, I can't give grades to people in the course, more people than there are seats in the room. But I'm wondering if we can, and I'm working on it, have an overflow room where the people who want to listen to it by podcast could go, or where, there, where in fact, maybe nobody needs to go, because enough people won't be in this room if it's podcast. How many would, well, I don't know, never mind. It's uh, no point in asking, no point in asking. But, uh, so I'm hoping by this combination of having an overflow room and having a TA, I can take the 50 people who are on the waiting list. They're still interested after my lecture today. And that would solve everybody's problems. Any, I'm surprised and happy in a way that there are only this many overflow room people. Uh, it may be that we don't even need an overflow room. I don't know yet. There, there's supposedly 150 people signed up for the course and 50 people on the waiting list. I don't know how many people. This room seats 150, I believe. So let's so stop worrying about that. Come and sit wherever you want. Uh, this table, we can move it out and you can sit on it. There's spaces for this for more people. Okay, now we'll, we'll just assume that everything is okay. Are there any problems that I should be worrying about already? Or can I start telling you general things about the course? Uh, well, we, let's give out the syllabus, even though it already turns out to be wrong. I think you'll rest a month off it. But that doesn't happen until later, so you might as well have it because it tells you the beginning. And... For next time, I would like you to read the first four books of the Odyssey, that, as it says, I think, in the syllabus. And I want to sort of coordinate books before we go any further, because it's important that we all have the same translation. There are dozens of different versions of the Odyssey and the Divine Comedy and the Aeneid running around. But when I lecture, I cite lots of passages, which I read and explain. That's just how I like to do it. Uh, it seems to me it works. People, it helps with the reading to be able to actually see how to read the, the book. And it also, I expect you to have the book so that you can cite passages at me if you think either that I've uh, missed something uh, that I need to know about because it either agrees or disagrees with what I'm saying. In general, I would hope that all of you would feel free to uh, get involved in and turn this into a big discussion section in effect because I think it's very important that people contribute and it's very important to me that I learn something. If I, if I ever stopped learning about these books, I'd stop teaching them or teaching it all together. So, now, well, uh, I hope you've all got your copy of the Odyssey. Anybody got it with them? Uh, anybody bought it yet? Look like this? No, that's not a good thing. Let's see if it has the page numbers like this. Okay, let's go to some page. Let's just go to the beginning of book two about Telemachus, which is what we're going to be. That's what we should, we're going to be talking about next time. My book two begins on page 19. How about you, Beatrice? Okay, so the one that she's got, which is the one in the in the bookstore, is the same as this one. We'll read the first four chapters in the Odyssey for next time. I'll put that down.
I have to look to see how to spell Odyssey. You'll get used to this. I'm dyslexic. I can't spell anything. When I write things on the board that are hopelessly misspelled, don't bother to tell me. It would take too much time and effort to get me to spell things right. Unless, unless I write them so wrong that you can't understand what I've written, then I think you better tell me. Okay. Uh, for next time, Odyssey books one to four. Okay. That's part of how... Oh, wow. Just in time. I didn't think this looked like the right microphone for iPods. All, luckily, all I've been saying is definitely I've been thinking, who wants to hear this? Halibut fishermen. I think we're set. We're now, we, we're also on some loudspeakers, aren't we? So we're now set. We're beginning philosophy six, from gods to God and back, which is also called man, God, and God, God man, and society in Western literature as the sort of general name of philosophy six, which was around before I started giving it and doing what I want to do, which is talk about polytheism and what it is, and how great it was, and how it would be nice if it came back. That is the moral of the course. But so now, where were we? We've, I've told you the assignment, and uh, now I'm going to tell you well, how, I, how, this, how I think about the kind of course this is. The first thing I want to do, you know what I want to do before any of that, is move this table. Can somebody help me? I feel far away from everybody in a useless sort of way. Why should we have this big empty space? Yeah, that's all right. Nothing's going to fall off, right? Terrific. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, as, it, as a co contribution to sort of truth and advertising, I have to tell you that this is like no other course in the department. I have to I tell you that partly just to because you should know that uh, don't take, if you go to other courses expecting them to be like this one, you're going to be shocked, maybe disappointed. That, but but it's, it's a great books course, really, or I'll talk in a minute a sense in which it's like and not quite like a great books course. But one thing is sure, there isn't a single philosophy book on the, in the reading. It's, it's these very, very important super classics that have focused a whole way of understanding everything. And uh, I'm going to try to, instead in philosophy courses, what you do is you try to find out what beliefs this person writing the philosophy book has, what, and what theses they have, what arguments they have for their position, and try to then sort of test the arguments that they've got for the view that they've got. This is different. What we want to do is read these books and understand the, uh, the, the under, I'll explain this a lot more in a minute, the understanding of being, to use this funny phrase, that this author has got in this book and see, so to speak, how the world looks from that point of view. And that's a big job and hard enough. And the, and the author will try to get you to uh, sort of empathize with and see the world from their point of view. They can't help it. That's their point of view. And that takes the place of what an argument for a, a belief system might be, is to be, to, to, to be as much as possible led to see what it would have been like, say, to be a Homeric Greek, how things looked to them. I'll come back to that a lot today to try to explain by the end of the day you should, you should have a sense of what it means to talk about the various understandings of being that uh, we're going to each of the each of these books represents a very radically different understanding of being so but I want to distinguish I said off the top of my head sort of 
that this is a great books course, but it's not the usual understanding of a great books course. I once upon a time took a great books course, and what we were doing was reading these books, to the, the, the great books, to discover what universal truths about what it is to be a human being and about God and about society and about nature that these great authors had captured and were giving us. I'm calling that a humanist understanding of the great books. That's just, that, that was humanist could mean lots of different things, but one of the things it means, at least the way I'm going to use it, is somebody who believes that there is a human nature. There is some essential features of what it is to be a human being, and that uh, the great books then contain insights into this nature. And since we in the West are getting clearer and clearer about self and society and what it is to be a thing, and what it is to be nature and, and, and God and so forth, you read the great books to uh, see how much of what we understand better they already understood. It's a very smug way of reading books. I'll talk more about, read you a few quotes from people reading the Odyssey that way. Uh, now, there would be another way of reading these great books, which uh, would treat them as, not, uh, to say that they were works of art. I'm using this, I'm, this vocabulary is sort of mine, but I have to have ways to name these things. If you think, it's, if you think the book is a work of art, then you think that it shows you another world, different from ours. <clears throat> and maybe, in some ways, it'd be better to be living in that world than in this one. It hasn't got this smug view that we know already, where we know more than the people we're reading, but it's nice to see how much, in the, given their darkness, uh, the, their benighted state, uh, Homer or Virgil or Dante managed to get right, or Shakespeare even better. But that's not what I want to do. So, but I'm going to read you one quote about looking at this stuff we're reading as great books, so I can tell you, so you can see how different it would be, and, and I think how rare it is probably to look at them as, as works of art. That is, books that might teach us something that we don't know as modern Western European human beings. So here's somebody named Kivy, whom I don't even know who he is, and I don't care, really, uh, saying what a great book is. And he's trying to persuade people that it's worth reading these classics like the Odyssey. He says, the most persuasive and influential defense of art, I, I'm not sure it's not my sense of art, but anyway, in a humanistic education, see, that's why I want to call this the humanistic reading, in a humanistic education centers around the belief that works of art, I'm going to put in great books every time he says works of art, that the great books are sources of knowledge, that artists like physicists, biologists, or economists are discoverers and teachers of truth. That notice the claim there now, that there is some cross-cultural universal sort of truth about human beings, and just like a physicist can tell you the universal truth about nature, that there are electrons, for instance, with a certain spin and charge and weight and so forth, and that's true for everybody for all times. Well, luckily, <clears throat> there are these very smart people writing these books who uh, understand also truths that about, not about nature, but about human beings. <coughs> so he says, what, going on with him, what defenders of the knowledge claim of the fine arts tells us is that we can find in the fine arts something that we cannot find in the natural sciences, something called humanistic knowledge, or better, knowledge about ourselves as human beings. Now, that suggests, you know, that we, that we just like electrons have an essence and we can find out what it is, or gold has and so forth, human beings have some essential structures and we can find out what they are. But the philosophers I like and teach, and in philosophy seven, teach a bunch of them, are philosophers like Pascal, who's on your syllabus, because he's in this one, and Kierkegaard, I'm not going to write them on the board since they're not in this course anyway, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Sartre. Heidegger I have to write on the board because Heidegger is the secret person behind all of this.
Martin Heidegger. Uh, he lived, I never know dates, his big book was 1927, Being in Time. And that he talks already about what he calls the understanding of being. But Heidegger, Heidegger's got a view about art, which I'm going to get to in a little while. But what Pascal, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Sartre all have in common is the claim that there's no universal truths about human beings, no interesting ones. Maybe that they are featherless bipeds and they, they laugh and do... I mean, there are sort of accidental general truths about human beings, but no, no essential truths about human beings. Sort of if you knew them, you'd know, for instance, like if, if all human beings were essentially rational animals, as Aristotle said, you'd know a lot about what human beings could do and should do and shouldn't do and so forth. But these existentialists all claim that there aren't any universal truths about human beings of any interest because they don't have any nature or any essence. Well, how does that, what, why do we think that they do? Well, because in each given culture, they have a way of understanding themselves as having an essence. And in fact, and Pascal is in here because he said, custom is our nature. That Pascal was way super genius, who was way ahead of everybody else, already in, what, 1650. Uh, he was the first existential thinker. We'll come back to him when we read him, when we get to 1650. But he said that when he says custom is our nature, he means that it's the social practices, to use a technical term from another philosopher, Who's, uh, the two great philosophers of the 20th century, it's now become pretty clear, are Heidegger and Ludwig Wittgenstein. They have a lot in common, although they hardly read each other. Well, Heidegger certainly never read Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein did read Heidegger and said he thought there was, Heidegger was getting at something important. I see that you can't see that. And that's too bad, so I'll put it up here. Okay, so uh, why am I putting that on there? Okay, so uh, the, hi, why am I? Uh, Heidegger and Wittgenstein, oh wait, for practices. The, the Wittgenstein term for all the ways we have of doing things that give us our understanding of what it is to be a human being. This is what Pascal calls custom. I'll come back to that too in a minute. I mean, it's all sorts of things like, I mean, how, now I'll, don't mind. I always tend to try to say everything at once and get ahead of myself. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, however, whatever it is, all the things that people do and say and the way they stand, here I'm saying it again, and the way they dress and what distance they stand from each other and how they greet each other and how the various genders are defined and how men are related, that is, to women or really something more general like what counts as masculine and feminine. All, and all of that is the practices. And all of that is what defines what it is to be a human being in any particular culture. And I'm going to get the microphone back. There is no way to get this microphone to stay on. Okay, so that, so there's no universal cross-historical Across all cultures, answer to what human beings are essentially. Each culture defines for itself what human beings are essentially and enables them to live as if they do have some nature so that they know what they're here for and can have some kind of orientation as what's worth doing and what's not worth doing and what's good and what's bad and so forth. And as history changes, so do people's understanding of what it is to be a human being, what it is to be a thing, what it is to be nature, what it is to be a god. In this course, we're going to see a huge spectrum of different understandings of what it is to be a god or god. And, and, in, uh, and in terms of each of these understandings, things show up in a certain way. People say show up as uh, heroes and uh, slaves in the Homeric world, or, or heroes and just ordinary people, and people uh, show up or see themselves as saints and sinners in the medieval world, 
That's very, very different understanding of people and of the, the world. I'm going to say more about that in a minute, too. This d jargon of what people show up as is Heidegger talk. You need some kind of talk. It isn't what people are because they don't have any nature. And it isn't exactly what they become because they, uh, other, pe other people in different cultures become different things. It, it's not this picture that over the history of the human beings, they get clearer and clearer about what human beings are. But in any given epoch in the history, and in, or in any given culture, they show up, they, they understand themselves, they behave as if they were such and such, say, heroes or saints. Uh, so the, the Greeks, for instance, have their own way of doing things, of greeting each other, of having these feasts together, of having their funeral events, and of, of fighting and dying, and you can't really say loving because that hadn't been invented exactly yet, but of relating in some deep way between men and women, uh, and that allowed people to show up as and, and to be, insofar as you could be anything, and as long as you don't think that to be it means to be it essentially, it allows people to be heroes and slaves and very wonderful women like uh, Penelope waiting for Odysseus. And, but just to go through these more, because it, you've got to get a feel for what it is to have a world and have an understanding of being, that the medieval practices are so different. I mean, they've got uh, humility instead of heroes. They've got confession, whereas the Greeks, heroes, the Homeric Greeks didn't even have any inside. They, uh, they, every, they, they cry a lot. They, everything, when, when things go wrong, heroes cry. Uh, and the, one of the brilliant things that Odysseus can do, who's cleverer and smarter than anybody, is to feel terrible grief and not cry. His eyes remained as dry as stone, Homer says. So this is a very, that, that, there was, that he had something inner. He could do, he, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, Whereas, and the, it's the Christians who really invented the inner. Uh, Augustine, St. Augustine, who we don't have time to read, is, is got a strong sense that what's really important is all secret and private inside. And he has this wonderful story in the Confessions about St. Jerome. St. Jerome had a very, just like Odysseus had this very amazing quality that he could cry without his, with his eyes dry, St. Jerome could do something even more remarkable. He could read to himself. And people came and stood around to watch him reading the Bible without even moving his lips. He was communicating in, with himself inside. And uh, Augustine says that's just remarkable. So uh, the medievals had a lot to do with inventing the, uh, our idea that we've got this private inner experience. I think everybody knows they've got private inner experience and desires and dreams and fantasies and stuff. But the, the, what the Christians dis discovered was that that was crucially important. Discovered is the definitely wrong word. What the Christians just, what, demonstrated in the way they lived, it was crucially important. For instance, confession was crucially important. It was very important to know what your desires were and to tell them to other people to see if they were all right and acceptable. Uh, the, the, the Greeks didn't quite care, care. Homeric Greeks didn't care about their desires. They didn't even notice they had desires. So, but the, the medieval practices of confession, for instance, of prayer, of humility, and also the fact that there were tests for miracles, all that made it possible to be a saint or a sinner. And saints uh, were loving and compassionate and in a certain sense weak. They turned the other cheek and so forth. That wouldn't be possible in Athens. It isn't that there were saints walk, walking around in, well, not Athens, I, that's a mistake, really. I should say in Argos, uh, or, in, or on, on the battlefield where, well, I guess I'll remember if I don't have my pen. So, but it, uh, it wouldn't have been possible in Homeric Greece to be a saint. That, that kind of humble person who turned the other cheek when let, and in effect let everybody else walk all over them, would be more like a slave. And it wouldn't be possible to be a hero in medieval Christianity. 
A hero is somebody who is so powerful and strong and self-sufficient that they don't need anybody to take care of them, and they're able to protect and take care of everybody else, and people will sing, great so- sing songs about them at great dinner parties. That's, that's not, from a Christian point of view, how one should be behaving and what one should be aiming for. Uh, and uh, Dante, as you'll see, puts uh, Odysseus in the way down in hell, which he's got ranking all the bad ways to be. I think, I think Odysseus is eight circles down out of, I don't remember, maybe ten. Uh, so uh, because Odysseus was so self-sufficient and also because something which bothers Dante a lot, Odysseus was interested always in uh, going where no, no one had ever gone before. That was, his, that was his whole idea, to have new experiences and see new things. That was not what you were supposed to do, according to Dante. And then uh, there's us, which got, we got here by two stages. There's modernity, which is the Enlightenment, which uh, gets uh, sort of focused by a philosopher named Kant, uh, and but and what you, what Kant said that was the essence of modernity was maturity, and what is maturity is to take responsibility for yourself and what you do, and to be able to in his language give the moral law to yourself and justify what you are doing to yourself and to everybody else. That's and that means well, has lots of implications. You don't do what the king says you have to do or what the Pope says you have to do. You do what you understand that you should be doing. And that's, but that's not ours anymore. I think we're postmodern, though people are having trouble trying to understand what it is to be postmodern. Heidegger had his own views about it, and I think they're very interesting. Uh, the, the test, sort of testing Heidegger, if I ask you, think to yourself, what uh, would you say you want to get out of? not surely to be a hero that people sing about at dinner parties. I doubt if very many of you want to be saints. Uh, I think a lot of you still are just modern and want to be mature and independent, what Kant says, autonomous, which means something like self-sufficient and giving the law to yourself. But I don't think even that's what it is anymore. Nietzsche was the first to come across what it is to be postmodern. Uh, how's this? That I mean, I can't ask you all to tell me. Either. I, I love to hear. But when I ask myself this, I, my answer would be something like, well, I want to get the most out of my possibilities. That's, that's uh, I think, sort of evidence for my feeling that that's what we all really think is in 2001. I thought it was great in 2001 when Hal was being interviewed on, on, on his, I guess it was his birthday, on the ship, and they ask how is he happy on the mission? And you probably don't remember what he said, but he said, I'm using all my capacities to the utmost. What more could a rational being want? So he was getting the most out of his possibilities, and that's what now any rational being wants. That isn't what any Kantian rational being wanted. Uh, he wanted to understand the moral law and uh, make it his own, so to speak. So, okay, so there's this whole history of um, understandings of, again, different whole understandings of what it is to be a human being, and with this goes understandings of what it is to be a social institution and what it is to be a thing. I'll try to illustrate that in a minute. It all adds up to a different, whole different style of behavior, and now I hope you can understand why one might want to say it leads to a different understanding of being. Because uh, it's not just, you know, what it is to be a table or a chair or even what it is to be a thing, but also what it is to be a person. There's some general, uh, well, all I can say is understanding, a, a, a style or something that, that goes, that, that, that you live in, and that's our, each culture's understanding of being. Now, does anybody want to say anything, by the way? I mean, have I already said anything that seems to anybody outrageously wrong or terrifically right or whatever? Uh, yeah. Wait, talk, talk real loud. I can't hear you.
Well, if you be, I mean, a culture could believe that there were human, universal truths about humans. You ask, well, what about a culture who, which is based upon that there are human, uh, universal truths about humans and what they, that they've been found in their past and they now have them as their tradition or something? Oh, well, let, let, let me just say, well, in a way, every culture has that. That's, but if you're an existentialist, if you're gonna, or if you believe this course, that's going to turn out to be an illusion, not a bad illusion, a very good illusion. But each culture thinks that they know what it is to be a human being. The best thing is to be a hero. The best thing is to be a saint. The best thing is to be mature. The best thing is, is to be what Heidegger calls a resource. <sighs> to get the most out of your possibilities. Let me think hard about this. There must be a way to get there. Not going to be. Aha! I have fixed it. Somebody else must be built backwards. Okay. Now, there we go. Um, so, so anyway, the, the, yes? Uh, no, different, right. Yes, I mean, you were trying to find out in the medieval world what God's choice for you was, what your vocation was. In fact, that would be one right answer to, if you, to what, what do you want to get out of your life? Well, I don't know what I want to get out of my life. I want to serve God, and I have to find out what he wants me to get out of my life. That's right. And uh, for the heroes, they grow up in a role. I mean, Odysseus hasn't got the choice as to whether he would rather withdraw and contemplate or whether he wants to lead the, his people from Argos into the Trojan War. He, that's what he has to do. Oh, you'll see that so clearly. In the, well, let's wait till we read the Oresteia. The Oresteia has got this big moment when uh, uh, Agamemnon has to seemingly make a choice, but it isn't a choice. He has to, he has, he finds out what he has to do, not by God's command or God's calling. He doesn't have a calling, but he has a role. As king, there's something he has to do, and it's pretty terrible. Uh, well, you'll, you probably, some of you know, he has to kill his own daughter. Uh, and the, but then that's, again, not a free choice. Although he's free to not do it. I mean, it's not as if he, it's a kind of fatalism. Of course, if he, not, if he doesn't do it, he loses all of his self-respect as king and all the respect of his people. Uh, okay. So, anything else? I mean, that's good comments. Okay, let's go on. Uh, I'm going to, I want you to, I'm still explaining the understanding of being. What I want to give you is a feel for how sort of deep it is and how uh, unlike a bunch of beliefs it is. I mean, in sociology, people sometimes think, and I'm philosophy too probably, that I'm talking about various belief systems the Homeric belief system, the medieval belief system. There's a bunch of beliefs, and they subscribe to a different bunch of beliefs. It's not like that. It's much, much more basic. It isn't a mental thing at all. It's a kind of body thing. And to illustrate that, I found this uh, uh, account by a, a maverick kind of sociologist, I imagine. I don't know the person. But, and I don't even know if the account is right. It doesn't matter whether it's right. It's, but they're going to tell you about the raising of very early, very young babies in Japan and in the United States. Don't get hung up listening to it about the fact that it's all in sort of what looks to us now like sexist language to where the caretaker is always the mother and the baby is, the, is he and so forth. Uh, and, and, don't, and don't worry about whether it's right about Japanese babies either. That's not, not the point is to get it right. The point is to see a story anyway about how, un, how more deep than what you believe uh, this, this understanding of being is. A Japanese baby seems passive. He lies quietly while his mother in her care does a great deal of lolling, carrying, and rocking of her baby. She seems to try to soothe and quiet the child, to communicate with him physically rather than verbally. On the other hand, the American infant is more active and exploring of his environment, and his mother in her care does more looking at and chatting to her baby. She seems to stimulate the baby to activity and vocal response. 
It is as if the American mother wanted to have a vocal, active baby, and the Japanese mother wanted to have a quiet, contented baby. In terms of the styles of caretaking of the mothers in the two cultures, they get what they want. A great deal of cultural learning has taken place by three or four months of age. Babies have learned by this time to be Japanese and American babies. That is, they've got two radically different understandings of being, and it shows up everywhere. The American baby is going to have lots of desires, individual desires, and it's going to be happy to have all those individual desires and cultivate its individuality. The Japanese baby on this story is going to have a lot of sense of integration into the family and into the workplace and into the culture. And, and the bottom line is the, the Japanese uh, one will seek some kind of consensus and actually be able to arrive at consensus because people will be willing to give up their desires. Whereas the most that the, the American baby is going to be able to do is reach a kind of compromise in which you keep your desires and I keep my desires, but I take a few, I'll have to give up some of the things I want and you'll have to give up some of the things you want. But the idea that there could be some consensus in which we could find a way in which we did something that we all really wanted, that's, that's not that's not possible, it's not even desirable. So, and the, so the, col the way the politics works in the culture, another, uh, the way the um, relations between the people work is going to be different, and it's, of course, not what the Japanese and American babies believe. They don't believe anything. It's, just, it's a whole way of feeling and acting and sitting and standing. And it's a, wh whether you uh, take a rattle and listen to it like, the, like a rain stick, one of these quiet things that might put you to sleep, I picture that as a Japanese baby, whereas you could use the rattle to make a lot of noise and throw and throw so that your parents have to go get it. And that sounds to me more like what an American baby does, would do with the rattle. So, so there you go. So, and, oh, and things. You would have a different view of things. I, this is, I'm making all this stuff up now, but it's, it's supposed to be to have some sense of this difference. I take it a paradigm, perfect, wonderful thing might be a teacup. It's traditional, it's beautiful, it's, it's delicate, uh, and so forth. That wouldn't be our perfect thing, I don't think. Our best thing might be a styrofoam cup. You, it keeps the, the, the old teacup doesn't keep the tea very hot, and if they had iced tea, it wouldn't keep it very cold, and you've got to be careful because it breaks, and you've got to keep it clean, and then you've got to have a place to stack it when you're not using it. That's a drag. A styrofoam cup really keeps the tea hot and the iced tea cold, and when you finish using it, you can just throw it away. Uh, that's a good thing. And so, so in every area, you'll, you'll, if you just think about it, you'll imagine at least that there could be these important differences. Um, another one is that we just got into. Tradition is important, I take it, in, in a culture like the Japanese. And progress is the big deal in our culture. I mean, we're always getting doing things better than the people in the past, where there are plenty of cultures in which it seems that people in the past were doing things better and we're, we're losing it. And then maybe there are people, Japan is, if any place, close to it, where they are preserving their culture. What did I just read yesterday? I don't know whether this, what, what about this? Maybe some of you do, that, the, that the, they wanted to have a test for using chopsticks to make sure that people aren't losing the, the skill of, of using chopsticks. And, I mean, that's a very interesting thing to do, to care about. Okay, so let's see. And then... There's something else which I don't see how it relates directly to this, but it's important. That Well, yes, I think it is. There's gods, lots of gods, gods of the family, gods of the location where you are and so forth. It's very different than this one monotheistic, voluntaristic God. I mean, this God who just has all kinds of willful notions about what, it, what people should be doing. And whereas the... the, the Thousands of gods in Japan are more or less just consecrating the sacredness of places, of families, of meals. I was in Japan for a month and teaching there. There's a god for exams. There's a god for everything. Uh, there's more gods than they've got names for. It's a very different way of thinking about things. And not thinking, but experiencing things. And uh, again, so that's supposed to tell you that the understanding of being is even more deep than the practices because the practices are already somehow how people are 
uh, behaving in, in their relation to the institutions and, and traditions and so forth. The baby's getting, getting ready to take on different practices at this very basic level. Okay, I'm going to read you one more. These are the kind of sociologists I like. The, this one is a terrific guy. I'll write him up here. It's not that you're ever going to come across him again unless you're in sociology, probably, but I like him a lot because he's so tuned into this understanding of being that we're talking about. Pierre Bourdieu. Pierre Bourdieu is a French sociologist who has this very Heideggerian sense of things and who, who told me once Heidegger was his first love in philosophy, if you can see it. Um, he says, a whole group and a whole symbolically structured environment exerts an anonymous, pervasive pedagogic action. The essential part of the modus operandi, which defi he writes terribly, by the way. That may be required for French sociologists. I, I don't know. No, it doesn't, because Levi-Strauss Levi was another. In fact, Bourdieu is just overthrowing Levi-Strauss. Every generation of French intellectuals sort of destroys the life work of the previous one. And this is all anti-Levi-Strauss. The whole, okay, where were we? <laughs> okay, the, the essential part of, of the modus operandi which defines practical mastery is transmitted in practice without attend, attaining the level of discourse. That is, nobody thinks about it and nobody talks about it. They just do it. The child imitates not models but other people's actions. Body hexes, that's sort of your, I think, Hexes sometimes means skill, but I hear it, I think it means something like posture or stance. Um, uh, where were we? Uh, body hexes speaks directly to the motor function in the form of a pattern of postures that is both individual and systematic because linked to a whole system of techniques involving the body and tools in charge of a host of social meanings and values. In all societies, children are particularly attentive to the gestures and postures which in their eyes express everything that goes to make an accomplished adult. A way of walking, and now comes a nice list of these subtle things. A way of walking, a tilt of the head, facial expressions, ways of sitting and of using imp implements, always associated with a tone of voice, a style of speech, and how could it be otherwise a certain subjective experience. So notice that subjective experience is now not this great special thing you are, your most private inner thing, that a kind of spin-off from this shared public way of behaving, the, all these practices. And I want to just give you a few other examples because then you've got to keep, you've got to have this sense of what the understanding of being is or, you, or the whole course gets lost on you. So let me go on a little more about that. Um, so we've seen, okay, for Bourdieu, that the posture, gestures, style, and so forth, reflects what it means to be competent, accomplished in a culture. Uh, and there, in our culture and in every culture, there are all these subtle things that nobody even notices or thinks about which are helping define what it is to be a person. My favorite example, it isn't one that Bourdieu mentions, he might have, is distance standing. In every culture, people stand different distance from each other. I mean, there are the up-close cultures like, say, North Africa, and there are the far-away cultures like uh, Scandinavia. And uh, John Searle, one of my colleagues, has this very funny story about how in an international meeting, you can see the people from, say, Algeria backing, uh, somebody from Algeria backing somebody from Norway into a corner because the person from North Africa is trying to get near enough to have a conversation, and the person from Scandinavia is trying to get far enough away to have a conversation. And this just goes on, and you don't even, you don't notice it. But and your parents gave it to you, but they didn't notice it. But your but kids or babies are amazing imitation machines. I mean, they pick it up. We all picked it up without ever even noticing it was happening. And it's complicated. You stand different distances from people with if they're intimates with you, if they're strangers, if they're authorities, whether they're of the same sex or the opposite sex. And then you have all kinds of wonderful variations on, on the right distance to stand, even in your culture. A different distance if you're in a quiet reading room, 
Then you have to, and a different distance if the other person you're talking to has the flu far away. And if there's an air hammer in the background, it's okay to stand nearer. And this, and this isn't just a, a random thing that's distance standing. In cultures that are intimate with each other, they'll put, they're putting their arms around each other more. They are, uh, they are feeling more consensus-like. And in our culture, we want our independence, though not so far as the Norwegians. And uh, so, so there, uh, how, what, what the distance standing goes with hugging, it goes with putting your arm around people, it goes with who's able to kiss whom. A friend of mine who's Polish was just telling me, I didn't realize this, that the Russian men kiss each other on the mouth, that you see on TV, Brezhnev kissing the, the prime minister, another man. Uh, and this is just, I mean, that's how it is in that culture. And uh, so, and that goes with a whole lot of other relations between men and between people. So, now, okay, I'm going to read you now one from what you're going to read later, and which you, won't, which you can now perhaps understand. Well, what, what I've, we've been saying is the whole understanding of the universe and of human being is embodied in us, each of us. Okay, here's Melville saying it in, the, in a wonderful way that a writer can, just the opposite of Bourdieu's way of saying it. So, Queequeg, how many have read Moby Dick already? Uh, not so many. Okay, Queequeg is a, uh, a savage, as, as uh, Melville calls him, ironically. He's a, a black guy who's a uh, uh, harpoonist who's very, very wise and very, very different. Many spare hours Queequeg spent in carving the lid of his coffin. He's dying. With all manner of grotesque figures and drawings, and it seemed that hereby he was striving in his rude way to copy parts of the twisted tattooing on his body. And this tattooing had been the work of a departed prophet and seer of his island, who by those hieroglyphic marks had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and earth. Theory is a mistake on Melville's part. I mean, it's not a theory. That's too intellectual. A complete understanding of the heavens and the earth. And a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth. So that Queequeg, in his own proper person, was a riddle to unfold a wondrous work in one volume whose mysteries not even he himself could read. You see what he's saying there? So incarnated in you, in your body, are all these attitudes and skills and gestures and practices which you don't know about. And you, if you did, you couldn't understand what they all mean. And you, but they're, they're much too complicated, well, subtle and, and whole and ramified. But the, so Queequeg is it but he doesn't know it, he can't read it, but he knows that it's sacred and valuable, and so sacred and valuable that he's carving it on his coffin. And I won't tell you because it would be too much to give away the end of the book. That coffin turns out to be very important because it's got on it, presumably, this, the, this kind of understanding of being, which is the most important, most valuable, most sacred thing you can have. Because if you didn't have it, you wouldn't know what to do. You wouldn't know what it was to be a human being, what to strive for, what to, what to stand against and object to and so forth. And so Queequeg is preserving that. Uh, and, and now a real artist, I mean even more of an artist, a poet, says it most clearly and simply. I have a poster in my office, I used to, I haven't got it now in, right now, where Yeats says, man can embody truth, but he cannot know it. That's the bottom line of what I've just been saying. Man can embody an understanding of being, but he does, can't know it. It's interesting, I, some, a student pointed out to me the last time I read this, and I think it's good, that he, he, man, he doesn't say man can embody the truth as if there was only one. Each, each culture has its truth. So he's saying man can embody truth, but he cannot know it. And he's certainly not saying man has a theory about truth. That would be, that's the kind of thing you can know. That's a little, little mistake in Melville. So Yeats has got it completely right in one sentence. I'll just say it again. Man can embody truth, but he cannot know it. So that finally gets us to the work of art. Because the work of art has a very special relation to the fact that this understanding of being is absolutely important. The whole culture lives out of it and uh, understands everything in terms of it and, uh, and yet doesn't, doesn't know it. It looks like 
with this understanding of being, which isn't in the mind, but in the general style of the culture, is invisible, must be invisible, and stay in the background because it's so pervasive and so subtle. It would be like water to the fish. Uh, in Heidegger language, the understanding of being is nearest to us and therefore furthest away. If, if you just are, if you are it and everybody around you is it, then you live in it, but you don't see it. So how do people ever become aware of it? And why would it be important to become aware of it anyway? If, you're, if you are it, just be happy you are it and go about your business. But um, it's, it's important, it turns out, that uh, to really live the whatever life your culture wants you to live, that you see it and you share it with others and you share the fact that you all share it because that way you can live more in line with it and you have it, and you have a sense that you could preserve it and enhance it and even if need be rebel against it and change it our big rebelling against it and change it person is going to be in the in the gospel of john but uh, they're there you know, or martin luther king well that would be the current one very very current i mean he certainly had enough of an understanding of the practices that he could uh, he could see what was wrong with them and he could uh, he was a work of he was a work of art in a way heidegger thinks works of art don't have to be paintings and temples and poems they can be people who uh, are in a sense martyrs to a new way or a, or a change i mean really martin luther king is a good example i hadn't really thought about it but it, because what he's doing is uh, preserving and focusing and making more coherent our understanding of being, our understanding of, of people and of society and so forth. And to do that, he also has to make it, has to hold it up to the people who share it. So, so now we're talking about that. There are people and objects like temples and cathedrals uh, and thinkers like philosophers whose job it is to hold up to the people and show them what they are up to. Ooh, I skipped something here. The, before there are works of art that do that, there's something more, fund more primitive that does that, and that is myths and rituals. The myths and the rituals already sort of dramatize and hold up to the people what they're up to and what's important. Uh, um, another uh, soci sociologist, anthropologist, Clifford Geertz, who is a big hero of, uh, in this line of people, has a very famous article called The Cockfight in Bali, in which he shows in great detail how what it is to, to get the cock and to train it and to, and, to, and to bet on it in the fight and to be able to accept losing and know how to also sort of triumph in when, you're, when your bird is the one that wins and so forth. A whole understanding of what it is to be a, a masculine is built into the cockfight. And the women have, have their rituals. It happens to be weaving in Bali, which I gather has to do with sort of unity and community and bringing people together. It certainly doesn't have to do with having fights and being able to accept victory and uh, accept defeat and triumph and so forth. It's a different understanding of being, but they're both Bali understandings of being in a way that I, that I don't, well, I don't know what Geertz would say about this because what's interesting is that it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a ritual or a myth or anything that, that holds up the unified Bali understanding of being. There is one for the men and one for the women. A work of art is one stage beyond that. It holds up for everybody, whatever it is that is the unifying thing that makes you uh, a Greek or a Christian or uh, there is no unifying thing in Bali, I think. They, they, they turn out, if you looked at their gods, I'm sure there must be a polytheistic culture. There must be a god for weaving and a god for cockfights and a god for other things. But uh, the, a work of art is, holds up the understanding of being uh, for the people and focuses it and 
glamorizes it and so that the people can see and appreciate their particular style, their understanding of being. Uh, it, it, and they can share it. And they, they can consciously guide their lives by it. And it gives them this a moral space so that they can, for instance, Homer did it. He showed people what it was to be heroes and slaves. And, and they could then be, be more guided by the, the hero possibilities than they, they had before. Um, and it surely glamorizes it. It makes the heroes uh, so, so impressive in the, in the Odyssey, as you'll see, and in the Iliad in a different way, but equally Amazing. So, uh, so here's Heidegger now summing up what he says the work of art does. Uh, so remember now, the work of art, just to sum again, say it again, focuses, glamorizes, and unifies. It makes coherent the understanding of being. So in Heidegger jargon, he takes, the, he takes a Greek temple as an example. He says, it is the temple that fits together and at the same time gathers around the unity of those paths and relations in which birth and death, disaster and blessing, victory and disgrace, endurance and decline acquire the shape of destiny for human beings. The all-governing, notice it's unified now, the all-governing expanse of this open relational context is the world of this historical people. So when you, when you get enough unity to, and also to have a history, you, you get it, partly at least, because there are these works that do it. You see, now we're at great works. I mean, t temple is a work, uh, and so is the Odyssey. It's a very great work. It gives the Greeks the whole picture of what it is to be a king, what it is to be a father. You'll see what it is to be a son, what it is to be a, a wife. Uh, and a hero, of course, and so forth. They, they've got their model in there, and they've got their picture of and how, what it is to be a god, of course, and how all that hangs together. Uh, it, it manifests and holds up to them what it is to be a Homeric Greek, a Roman, uh, for instance, Augustus, who they took to be a god, and, and, and he was a work of art. God, works of art and gods have lots in common. They, they sort of unify and dramatize and glamorize whatever it is that's important in, in the culture. Uh, and it's important now just to say a few things that it's not, again. It's not something that represents something else. The, it isn't, that you, that's, again, it would be a belief system. You have a bunch of beliefs, and they represent the, the way the culture is going. Heidegger says he particularly wants to writes about the Greek temple as a work of art, because, uh, unlike, say, a book, because you can't imagine that, I mean, you couldn't imagine that the Greek temple represented anything. What would it represent? I mean, the book might represent the culture, get, a, get an accurate description of it. But the temple isn't an accurate description of anything. But it is, it is nonetheless a way that these people can see in the way it's made and in the way the pillars are and the way the frieze is and the, everything about it, what they care about what matters in their culture. The perfect example is surely medieval cathedral. How many of you have been to Europe already? Probably everybody. Uh, so you've been in the cathedrals. I mean, there the Christians can read everything that is, and feel everything that is uh, essential to, to Christianity. It's in Heidegger language, a work of art. And uh, Heidegger says the temple portrays nothing, which is, that's right. It, but it shines in Heidegger language. What does it mean to say it shines? It means that, and that you can see it better in the cathedral, uh, people see everything in its light. That's my sort of way to put this. Uh, why does Heidegger want to say it? it took me years? I couldn't understand. I didn't, the, the cathedral didn't look very shiny to me. And uh, then, then I see that what he means is that, uh, the, that in the light of this, perfectly clear, glamorized version of their understanding of being, they can see the, everything else as, uh, as more or less living up to it. Uh, uh, you, I want to see something here. No, I guess I don't, didn't write it down, but I think it helps to think. Now, so the, and one of the ways this gets done is by gods, particularly 
uh, in, in, in Homer, but it gets done by gods and goddesses even now. And then my favorite example is Marilyn Monroe. It's no coincidence that she was a goddess, people say. And it's no coincidence that she was a star. Stars shine. What, what, is it, what did she do that made her a goddess and made her shine? She was an exemplar, a paradigm of a certain way of being a woman so that women could understand themselves in terms of how much, more, how much they were similar to her style and men could relate to the women in the way men related in the movies and to, to Marilyn Monroe, they could see their relationship, the women could see who they, what women were, and the men could see their relationship to women in the light of her. That's, she, was a, she wasn't a total work of art because she certainly didn't unify all the aspects of the culture, but she was a, 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 a goddess uh, a, 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 which did a, a kind of job of focusing, of making more clear of glamorizing something that gave a kind of direction to a certain aspect of what people were doing. I, I think that helps understand why, why, and of course she doesn't represent anything. She's not a copy of anything. She doesn't symbolize anything. All that is, doesn't get at what it is to be a work of art. She manifests something and, that, and shows it. And in the light of it, people can see all around them, Marilyn Monroe's and, and people, and how far other people fall short of being Marilyn Monroe's. Uh, and, the, the whole, and so a work of art is just a big deal of a kind of star like that. It glamorizes a whole way of life. It shines, and people see themselves in the light of it. In uh, one sort of fancy talk for it, I want to call it a cultural paradigm. Remember I said example. Paradigm and exemplar are names for a particular thing, which is a, ex, a super good example of whatever they are things. Uh, how many of you probably don't know yet Kuhn? You know, how many know Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions? That's, where, that's a book in which the notion of paradigm became central. And he said every, in science, you've got to have a, a one exemplary work of, of, of that science, like Newton's Principia, and then all the other scientists can see what they're doing in the light of it. Uh, Kuhn never read Heidegger as far as I know, though I told him to every time I saw him. But he had a very Heideggerian sensibility as to this kind of work of art thing. It works in science. It works everywhere. But there is something which embodies and holds up to people the, the best version of what they're up to. Now, that means that to appreciate these works of art, one doesn't have aesthetic experiences. Heidegger is very much against the idea of aesthetic experiences. You, you, if you go into the, a Greek temple or, a, or a, the medieval cathedral and feel ooh and ah, and isn't that uh, moving, you're missing what, what it was really doing when it was a work of art. It's dead, according to Heidegger. It's all right. I mean, he doesn't care if you want to go ooh and ah, and that's the best you can do because uh, they're not organizing a culture anymore, a Greek temple or a medieval cathedral. And you can't experience them the way the Greeks did or the Christians did. Uh, still, Christianity is still around and some people can still experience them that way. But if, you, if you're just there as a spectator, you're missing the work of art when, as it was when it was working. This is sort of a Heidegger pun. When a work of art works, it shines and unifies the, the understanding of being stabilizes it, holds it up to the people. And when, and, and when it works, it gives us another quote from Heidegger, the temple first gives to things their look and to men their outlook on themselves. That's just another way. There are many, many ways of trying to say this rather novel or idea. Um, and then Heidegger equates the temple with a god because gods are, do this job of focusing and shining. So he says, by means of the temple, the god is present in the temple. That's his first way of putting it. And he says it's not a portrait of the god. It's, it doesn't matter to see how the god looks. The work lets the god be present 
and thus the work is the God himself. This is beginning to see, you have to see why the polytheism course and the fact that we're reading great works are related to each other. Great works, like the Odyssey, do this job of, in effect, creating the culture by holding it together and making it coherent and holding it up and unifying it and gives meaning to the life of the people who live in the light of it. All that, I think, is the job also and especially of God. And that we have to look into, but we aren't ready for that yet. Um, but the works of art then uh, give people a world. You can't, it's not exactly like they create a world. You could, if they were a creator god, just produce a world like, like the Christian god did. But the, the idea is that something like the Greek temple produces heroes and saints, only produces isn't the right word, creates isn't the right word, but it isn't inventing it out of nowhere either. You need something, we need some technical term. And so I want to say works of art constitute people as the kinds of human beings they are. Uh, given their works of art, they are going to show up to themselves and everybody else as heroes or slaves or loyal wives and so forth. And that's, that's the job of works of art. Uh, yeah, Beatrice. Ah, okay. You're way ahead of the story. But I can tell you this much now. There are really two kinds of works of art. And I haven't distinguished them. But I will distinguish them now. The, the ones I've been talking about, I want to say, are articulating works of art. That is, they make clearer and more coherent whatever understanding of being there is in the culture already and draw people into preserving it and making it even clearer and so forth. But then there are another, just I have to have words for this, reconfiguring works of art. A reconfiguring work of art does what Beatrice over there says, don't they sometimes change the culture, radically change the culture. That's the most extreme form of work of art. And uh, it's very, very interesting and very hard to do uh, because you, you have to somehow, and I, I am, I'm not ready to talk about it yet, I don't think. Let me see. Uh, well, I'll say it, although it, it, you didn't need, need a lot more to show it. I won't be able to show it until I get to the Gospel of John again. Jesus is an articulating work of art in, the, in, 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 in this sense. He changes radically changes the culture but you can't change it completely radically or nobody will understand what you're doing even you won't understand what you're doing and you won't be able to tell the difference between you would just be crazy but so it's very interesting and I'm not going to tell you how yet you have to be able to so to speak change the culture from the inside in such a way that it's radically different and yet you have to do it in such a way that it's not so radically different that people don't even know what they're up to and that, then you re, that's what re, reconfiguring works of art do. And you're right. That's the most interesting kind. We don't get to that until we get to the Gospel of John. Because all the ones we read, the Iliad, the Oresteia, the, the uh, Aeneid, which was actually sort of commissioned to be a work of art by Augustus, who just said to Virgil, you know, write something that tells us Romans what we're up to. All those were uh, articulating works of art. But then... then there are these reconfiguring ones, and uh, we'll get there when we get to, and, and, and the Gospel of John, more than any of the other Gospels, is sort of tuned into that. Uh, okay, anything else? Yeah. Personality? Uh, no, no, but it's good to ask. He, the, I have to repeat these. What? Hmm? I still couldn't hear you. Loud, loud. 
difference. Okay. The question is, I have to do this for the I, uh, the podcast people. The question is, uh, is, is being like personality, and if not, what's the difference? Well, personality is just a tiny part of understanding what it is to be a person, what it is to be a thing. I'm go back to my teacup example. Uh, the understanding of being dictates whether you like teacups or styrofoam cups more. It's much broader than personality. It's the whole style of what counts as interesting and valuable in, in, the, in the culture. And even the very idea, oh, this, that's one, one point. It's broader. But also, it's uh, somehow personality is already an understanding of being. The, I don't think the Homeric Greeks were personalities uh, or the saints either. I mean, saints may be getting closer because they had this inner. But, uh, uh, and I don't, uh, if what it is to be a personality, which is what it is to be, a, one view of what it is to be a person, that is to have your own style and your own uh, uh, ideas and so forth. Maybe that's nearest to the Kantian enlightenment thing. Is that where personalities get into the story? I haven't thought of it that way. But you see, you want the saints to be sort of self-effacing. They don't want to be personalities or have personalities. They want to be channels to God's love. So anyway, so it's, it's too special, it's too low, it's too restricted, and it's already part to be a personality is already to have a certain understanding, I think, of what it is to be a human being. I think it goes with having some inner truth and inner experience. It goes with a kind of romantic, romanticism. That, that to be a personality is to be very specially unique. That's part of it. And uniqueness is certainly not something that the Homeric Greeks and certainly not something the medieval Christians were wanted to value. Anything else? Careful. Yeah. Wait a minute. What am I doing here? Uh, go ahead. The works of art are not representational. Um, but then you characterize <coughs> the, the, the one kind of work of art as articulating or making clear um, sort of a, a kind of culture. Now, that strikes me as that's what I would have said was representational. Ah, uh, well, it's... Okay, good. Uh, so, what's the, why do I say works of art are not representations? Well, representations seem to want, uh, want to sort of copy. Mimesis is the humanist word for what happens in a work of art. They copy what's going on there. Copying is not strong enough. They have to, to articulate is to focus it in a way that it wasn't there yet. Uh, so the, the Greek temple can't be representing, so to speak, Greek beliefs and Greek values. That's all too uh, mental and intellectual. And also, now I'm adding, it's like there's something to copy. The, 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 the thought of, of getting a work of art is that you've got to articulate it, focus it. Of course, I see what you're thinking. I mean, you can't just come out of nowhere. It's out of the culture that you do it. But it's not as if the representation could, I don't know, get it, uh, getting it right as a, isn't enough. You've got to actually make it shine more and integrate it more than, than what you are copying. And then that's the sense in which it's not a copy. Uh, it, it does something. A representation just copies something. A work of art actually produces a certain understanding in the people who experience it, but it's got to be—it's got to be that culture, that sensibility that it's articulating in that much looser sense of representation. It does here in Heidegger language. He says it's not a representation and it's not a symbol. Maybe this will help. He says symbols refer to something beyond themselves. To and did they get their value and truth in how well they correspond and represent? But the, the Greek temple doesn't refer to some, something beyond itself. It, it's there to be the thing itself, to manifest something, and not to point towards something else. Symbols point towards something else. Representations copy something else 
the work of art doesn't do that. It, it as I, when I put it, glamorizes, focuses, articulates, something like that. You don't look completely convinced. But I, I see the truth in what you're saying, but I want to play it down and try to bring out the other half of it. Uh, okay. Let me, yeah. Well, the cathedral, because it, the, does the cathedral represent something beyond itself? Well, uh, if, if it does, how do I put this? It could be seen to be doing that to be symbolizing God or representing God or something like that. Is that what you're thinking? But I think Heidegger would say that would be a mistaken way to think about it. It's, it's the cathedral itself that's doing the job of producing the Christian culture in Heidegger's view. It's, and part of what it's doing is producing a certain understanding of God. But uh, it's not pointing beyond itself. It's the center of it all in his picture. Okay, let me go back to this. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. But some of your modern arts are trying to, like, show off the power of materialism and, like, how to serve a certain color or whatever. But in, in that case, it's more responding to the arts of darkness and Okay, the, well, I, I, uh, what she's saying is, I'm saying that when I say works of art, aren't, they're not really working if they're giving you a certain feeling. You could add things like op art, which is working when it makes you see things a certain way, and, you, and you're saying, and, and certain works of art are there to provoke you to have certain feelings of, I don't know, disgust or delight and all that. I think the answer is what we call works of art is very, very broad. But Heidegger just happens to have his own story. And he would have to say, he would just declare that those things are doing things. They're giving you experiences, visual and emotional, and the right, expo and the right reaction might well be, ah. But in, in his terms, when a work of art is working, he's got this sort of technical sense that what the work of art is doing when it's working is focusing a culture. It's just a kind of, I think, on his point of view, an accident that we call them both art. We call all sorts of things art. And if he, you had to ask him, I think he'd say, well, there's one special function that, that uh, uh, a person or an object or uh, what else? Uh, I don't know. At least people and objects could have. I'm sure there are other things. And, and built things could have, but natural things could have. What could they all have in common that would make them works of art working? Well, it could only be this focusing and shining. So let's say that that's the interestingest or best thing that, that art can do. And, uh, but it's interesting that he can't do it anymore. So now art has to do other things. Focus your feelings, give you uh, shock or give you awe. Well, awe is better for the cathedral. But give you feelings because there isn't anything anymore that can focus our culture. I don't know whether it's wh exactly why it is. I think it's because our culture doesn't have a unified. No, it isn't. Uh, that would be too hard to explain. Our, according to Heidegger, our culture has a unified understanding of being, namely that everything is resources, but that's not an understanding of being that you can focus. Uh, yeah. Is it that the work of art has to have a kind of human memory? It has to, it has to take up the tradition that people are living in, in that sense, a kind of memory. Yeah. Let's see now where we are. I've got three more minutes. I just want to see to get to some end of here. I think I am pretty much. Uh, so the work of, I'm going to just say three minutes of things. The works of art we read this semester, except for Pascal and Moby Dick, because they're already past the point where you can do it maybe, or at least Moby Dick is, they do the job of the temple and the cathedral. They unify and hold up to the people their understanding of being. That is, I said, that's what Homer and Aeschylus and Virgil and Dante do, each in their own way, which we'll talk about. And um, perhaps there's nothing doing that job for us now, and maybe there never will be again. And maybe, therefore, we have to think differently about what gods are and what work, how works of art could work. When, but we're going to do 
the Homer, classical Greek, Roman, medieval, and modern world and see how each of them is uh, focused in a work. See, but Moby Dick doesn't have anybody all, nobody, it doesn't unify the culture. Not everybody says, ah, oh, Moby Dick, that's what tells us what we really are and what we're all about. And <laughs> it's, uh, but, but I think Melville's trying and he does more than most. Okay, now let's see what else. Uh, okay, one last remark that obviously there are lots of different meanings of God that I've been using. And I, since it's in the title, I owe you something to say something about that. There is, and we're used to, the Judeo-Christian monotheistic creator God, or at least a lot of us are. A lot of us aren't, too. This is no longer simple, homogeneous Western culture. Uh, but but it, certainly the dominant understanding of God right around here is this monotheistic creator God view. But, um, and then there are works of art like the Greek temple or uh, like Marilyn Monroe in the most sort of scaled down version, which articulate some, either the whole unified culture or, or at least shine and hold up something uh, that gives people some sense of who they are and what they're up to. That's another kind of God. That's a Heidegger kind of God. And then there's the multiplicity of gods in the Odyssey. And that's a whole big story of its own. It's certainly not monotheism. They aren't works of art. The Odyssey is a work of art. But Athena isn't a work of art. Uh, and so we have to understand next how this amazing uh, Homeric conception of what a god is and what gods are. And that's going to start next time. And you read the first four books. And you ask yourself, sort of, what is Athena up to as a goddess? Then, and what is she doing to Telemachus? And why does she appear to Telemachus at this crucial moment in his life? Keep your eye on all that and read the first four books. And now, as for the course, I won't be able to tell you until next time, those of you who are on the waiting list, whether, we, whether I can take you or not, it all depends on either getting a bigger room or playing some kind of trick of some sort that will produce the same effect as having a bigger room. <laughs>